evening, everyone, and welcome to Sagicor as they present Let's Talk. Today, we're going to be talking investments in all of its forms and building that financial foundation. We've got a very exciting panel here with us this evening. I'm going to introduce them very shortly. But when we speak about investing, how does this help build a financial foundation? Where do you start? What constitutes an investment? And what are some of those examples of investments? And what should one consider when you're thinking about investing? Do you factor in one's age, stage, investment approach? Um, how much of your hard-earned money goes into these investments? And what would be considered a good financial foundation anyhow? We have lots of questions, and hopefully we'll have as many answers as we can possibly get in the time that we have with us today. Then I'm going to encourage you to use the question and answer um, toolbox to make sure that we get in as many of your personal questions as possible. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Gaynell Marshall. I'm really happy to be your moderator here this evening with a topic that just continues to bring more questions, more interest, and surprisingly, more investors, which is a good thing. This is what we want. So we just want to let you know that by the end of today's segment, you are also going to get something very special from Sagicor. I'm going to let you know what that is. It's a great way to start, I can tell you that, whether you're brand new or you're seasoned. But right now, allow me to introduce you to some of our panelists. We have some members from Sagicor, and we also have a couple of young entrepreneurs. I know you know exactly who they are. I'm going to start with the first one. We're talking about Miss Faith Calendar. That's right. She's an entertainer and a serial entrepreneur. She's a Forex and crypto coach, a fitness program facilitator and promoter, and most recently, digital investor. She received an honors in accounting and finance at the University of the West Indies, Cato, and she focuses on what she likes to call the four Fs of her purpose, fun, fitness, finance, and fruition. Welcome to you, Faith. We also have Danilo Hutchinson, most of us know him better as Hachi, a 34-year-old entrepreneur, DJ, and marketer with 15 years of international and regional account management experience. He also owns a transportation company and has worked in the entertainment industry as one of the leading MCs with the DJ duo Hachi and Sis. Welcome to you, Hachi. Shane Lowe is joining us from Washington, D.C., and Shane is a Barbadian economist with a keen interest in international finance, macroeconomic analysis, and modeling. His key professional interests include understanding the peculiarities of small, very open economies and assessing exchange rate and country risk. And he has previously worked in the areas of banking, uh, specifically the Central Bank of Barbados and CIBC First Caribbean. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of Glasgow, where he also earned his MSc in international financial economics and is the holder of the Global Association of Risk Professionals Financial Risk Manager Certification. Welcome to you, Shane. We also have Mr. Nicholas Neckles. He is currently the portfolio manager within Sagicor Asset Management Inc. with direct responsibility for providing recommendations and analysis to senior management for the execution of the investment policy of the Barbados segregated pension funds, mutual funds, and the Sagicor International Balanced Fund. He also provides quarterly and annual investment commentary for the segregated pension funds. He's currently a chartered financial analyst, charter holder, and a member of the Barbados CFA Society and CFA Institute. He is also a chartered retirement planning counselor and holds a bachelor's in economics from the University of Sterling in the UK. And finally, we have Michael Miller, who is the Sagicor Wealth Management Department leader, and he also holds a BSc in Honors, MSc, CFA, CAIA. He's an experienced finance and investments professional with an extensive career, education and training in investment management. He is currently a chartered financial analyst holder, which is the gold standard in his particular industry. Welcome to you all. How are you all doing this evening? Well, thanks. Great. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I'm excited to get right into it. Everybody has such incredibly varied uh, backgrounds, but investment seems to be uh, the key thread going through everybody's veins right here. So I'm going to start with Hachi. Um, 
What comes to mind when you think about the topic of investing and building your financial foundation? All right, so thanks. Uh, good evening to everybody locked on to the Zoom. Everybody's here already. Uh, thanks for the opportunity for having me here this evening. Um, when we speak about investments, um, I mainly think about try, trying to find the best ways to spend your buck um, to ensure that whatever you do spend is in the right place and it makes the most sense for you financially. Um, what I would say is make smart choices always with, with, with your finances and I really think it would work out well for you. Faith, I have the same question for you. What does finance, what does investing mean to you? Okay, so pleasure to be here is definitely um, good to be among so many people talking about investing because I think it's something that is definitely worth talking about and spreading to the masses. Um, investments to me means multiplying your money, looking for ways to multiply your money, you know, whether that be real estate, whether that be through different funds, um, whether that be Forex crypto, you know, there's so many different investment vehicles. Um, but the main thing is definitely, you know, as you said, making wise decisions um, to multiply that money, not just making it, but multiplying it. The amazing thing is that every time you think about investment, somebody else comes up with something brand new. And of course, the key phrase nowadays is cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and you're thinking to yourself, how do I keep up? I barely have an actual coin. And now people are telling me <laughs> about Bitcoin. And what do we do with this now? Like, where am I finding all this extra money for investment? What would you say? Uh, what I would say is that you don't necessarily have to look for the extra money that you were with what you have. Um, and something that I learned is how to spend up a dollar. Like, don't just spend that whole dollar into expenses or, you know, throw it all into savings, but, you know, learn how you can break down that, that dollar, put 10% into savings, put 10% into investment. Like, just do what you can to make that stretch instead of trying to find the extra money to then, you know, reinvest into something. So when you think about where to invest, though, um, let's face it, some areas are far more lucrative than others. Some economies um, have greater stability than others. And Shane, we can see from your portfolio that you really get a kick out of reading these things <laughs> in various countries. So, I mean, what are some of the perspectives and views that you've heard from individuals when it comes to investing? Yeah, well, certainly, um... At the end of the day, most investments derive their returns from, uh, you can think of it from a macro perspective. The faster economies grow, you tend to find that those countries, uh, investments tend to be more lucrative there. And the slower economies grow, um, investments tend to be less lucrative there. Um, certainly we're in a, a stage in, with a COVID where we're coming out of a, a low growth environment and many economies contracted significantly. Um, and so coming out of that, you're gonna find that stock markets around the world many of them actually declined in 2020 some of them at least and so there's a sharp rise in stock markets around the world has been over the last two years uh, what has actually been stopping a bit of that though has been the recent conflict in ukraine and then you have issues with high inflation and those are causing some of the um you know some of the markets particularly in the us to slow down quite a bit so recently you've had significant reductions in the value of stock markets um, but certainly I think looking at economies where they're going to rebound sharply or economies where over the long term they have um, they're likely to grow quickly over time i think those are where you want to be looking for in terms of uh, making investments now shocks to the economic structure of any country can't be new i mean we live in a region where hurricanes can can decimate you we've had our fair share of a lot of things that were just completely out of our control we've been through world war one and two and now as you said we're here um in a situation where fuel is definitely impacting everybody i would say all around the world i don't think anyone's been untouched by it so does that have a significant impact on whether or not people venture into investing or does it just change the way they invest i think it, i think it changes the way they invest i think um fuel prices being high might be a not so good thing for barbados but it certainly is a great thing for a country that exports oil um in the same way that it would be a great thing for a company that exports oil 
And so there's always this, what you sometimes call a zero sum game sometimes where some, someone might benefit on one end and someone might lose on the other. And so that's where it comes into having, uh, I suppose, portfolio managers or investors who can change what they invest over time and pivot depending on how the outlook changes for a particular country or a particular company. And in your capacity, you provide reports on where these um, economies stand in any particular time, especially at a time like now, you can say, well, look, things might be a little shaky over here, but it seems to be working over here. Yeah, so that is that is a part of my job. I'm not going to necessarily endorse one country versus the other. Uh, of course, I'd like everyone to invest in Barbados. So, But nonetheless, I, I'd say countries that are highly indebted um, and not only highly indebted, but they pay a very large amount of their revenues in, in, uh, in interest and repaying debt. Um, usually are countries that uh, tend to grow more slowly over time. Whereas countries that have a little less debt and are in a, a position where they have the ease of doing business is very strong and things like that, those tend to do a bit better. So uh, certainly it's usually the case over time, regardless of whether it's COVID or not, those countries that are in a better shape will tend to be the ones that perform slightly better. Well, like you, I too want to bring the focus back into Barbados. So now would be a great time to bring Michael into the conversation. Now, Michael, you have the wealth portfolio, which I know pricks a lot of ears now because you're the one that's going to, well, why don't you tell us exactly what, what um, advice you provide generally? Yeah, so thanks a lot, Yanel. Um, in terms of investing within the current climate. What we look for would be opportunities on the domestic side. Now, historically, it meant that government of Barbados debt would have been principally the investment that we would have mocked up a lot of the liquidity with. And it means that in terms of diversifying your portfolio, you have to look at all the other asset classes um, in the absence of there being um, I would say, you know, the desire to deepen exposure per se and to increase your concentration in one asset class like the government of Barbados. Now, in terms of the equity side of things, we have limited viability there because equities are thinly traded. And when you look at the Barbados Stock Exchange, there are only a handful of equities that are listed on the exchange. And we talk about price discovery, where, which really means um, the capacity for the stock market to generate what we call a fair value or fair price based on supply and demand. And there's no robustness in terms of uh, volumes being traded per se in individual equities to, to deliver the level of price discovery on the domestic side. Hence the reason why we always allocate or advocate for persons to invest globally. Now we operate within a foreign exchange restricted environment. So it means that obviously to invest outside of Barbados, it requires access to hard currency or US dollars. Now, that being said, um, you have to be kind of, I guess, intentional and consistent with your approach to accessing hard currency. It means you have to go through the central bank, seek the requisite um, approvals. And once you gain exposure, it is good to invest that exposure with um, some level of circumspection in the international markets. As we alluded to, and Shane would have alluded to it as well, we are going through a period of heightened volatility in international markets. You have the war, you have the pandemic, and you have the Fed and other central banks globally um, seeking to curb inflation through um, raising interest rates. It means that the, 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 the onset of these measures create some anxiousness within the markets and some anxiety, and, and effectively, it means that persons um, seek to, at times, move towards the sideline in terms of take some risk off the table, they may move to cash, they may rebalance the cash. What I would say is that as investors, and especially long-term investors, we don't necessarily look to time the market. Instead, we look to um, average costs and um, buy into the market at different periods of time, whereby you benefit from the dips and you also ride the recovery and therefore you benefit from the highs as well. 
And over the course of time, what you would develop is an average cost portfolio. Right now, with the pullback in international equities, this is a good buy in time. This is a moment where persons could see an opportunity to leg into the market. And effectively, no one has a crystal ball. So yes, it can go further south, but also um, over the course of time and the approach to which you buy in, meaning that you're looking for quality companies that can ride out the various market cycles, it means that over the course of time, you will benefit from the recovery. Okay, so I just want to draw people's attention back to the um, notion of today's discussion, which is to build a financial foundation. So it's not just about putting your eggs in one basket because it'll overwhelm the basket and perhaps damage the eggs. You want to put it in as many different baskets um, and kind of shockproof yourself wherever that can possibly happen. And you are going to probably need the services of a portfolio manager. So perhaps Nicholas, you can tell us what your role includes, um, especially within Sagicor, what advice do you give individuals with respect to the things that they should be thinking about when investing is on the table? Yes, thank you. Um, investing, I like to consider it is a process. So you start off with a goal, um, a particular goal that you have in mind, a financial goal, and the goal should be specific. It shouldn't be, I want to be rich when I retire. It should be, I want to retire at age 67. I want to maintain my current standard of living. That's one way of looking at it. Based on that goal, you will set um, an allocation, and then you would observe what your risk tolerance is. So for instance, Hachi, he's a young person. He's 34, so potentially he has over 30 years before he retires. So his risk tolerance level would be higher than say even mine or, or someone who's closer to retirement. Therefore, he can take on more investment risk. So as Mike alluded to, now is a good time to invest in, in equities, for, for instance. Um, people understand the concept of when there's a sale in a supermarket, you go in and you buy as much as you can. It's the same for, for investments, especially if you have a long, a long investment time horizon. So um, now is the time if you have savings, the way you can look at how much savings you have is create a cash flow statement for yourself. Um, it doesn't have to be complicated. I know once we are accounting, we get nervous, but you can basically look at your bank statement, mm -hmm. whichever account you have where you receive your um, salary, it could be a savings account. Um, look at your opening balance for one month and look at your closing balance at the end of that month. You can do that where now in May, you can do that up to April, say, take an average of what that opening and closing balance is. And if you have a positive closing balance each month, that suggests the amount you have um, to invest. Now, some may say, well, when I do that, it, it's not looking too good, it, it's, it's less. That's where you have to make tough decisions um, and sacrifices. When there's something that we like to do, we always find a way to do that. Investing, if you really want to do it, you can find a way. So for instance, you can look at subscriptions that you have. A number of us have a lot of internet subscriptions that we don't always use. You can cut down on those. Try to avoid um, impulse buying. Um, when you leave your home, know exactly where you're going and go there. <laughs> don't deviate, gas is high, um, things like that. Um, so that's just some of the, the ideas that I would throw. So it's an overall attitude, as Faith was alluding to earlier, it's an overall attitude to how you see every individual dollar, how you can split this dollar up. Everything doesn't have to go into the one product. You might have 10% here, 5% there, uh, maybe 30% there. 
and save the other 50% wherever you can. I'm just throwing out numbers. I'm not the investor or the risk management portfolio expert. But some may ask the question, they're like, it sounds all well and good, but every month I have a negative balance and I'm not splurging and I'm not impulse buying and I'm sacrificing all that I have and I'm just not seeing the room for investment, even though I want to. What advice would any of you give to that individual? Well, I would say um, in terms of um, budgeting, I, I kind of go the opposite way um, to, to Nick, right? In that sometimes you have to set aside the investment up front and kind of spread the residual. That way you make investing intentional, you make it consistent. So it's almost like we always say, and to that same individual, Tomorrow, if the government were to go and raise tax, you would see a case where that person will have no choice but to live on the residual. Why can't we tax ourselves and tax ourselves in a way that could potentially build our wealth um, through compound interest over time? So take it off up front. And there are ways to do so. so you're kind of automated. You're kind of either through your, in your workplace, you get a direct debit. And right now, many banks, they have very, um, very, very sophisticated platforms that allow you to almost set up a, a, a automatically reoccurring payment on a month by month basis or however frequently you desire. So you can do those, use those mechanisms to your advantage. And you know, once you gain the habit of doing it over time, it becomes easier. And from there, you spread the rest of your revenue. And then on the expenses side, where possible, you, you try to inflate that by a little 5% or so, so that, because it has to be realistic too, it's like a diet. If you wanna lose weight, they say the best diet to use is the one that you can stick to. So at the end of the day, you have to still find an approach that you can stick with over the long term. All right, so we have two perspectives and two um, different methodologies, and I suppose that for whomever that can work, we can apply. But now what about the person who, myself included, I'm not sitting there reading the NASDAQ index every day. I'm not sitting there reading, you know, stocks and portfolios every day. Sure, I'd love to invest some money so I don't go impulse buying or starting to feel rich before I am. And I want to put some money away in investments that can work for me over time when I sleep. But let's just say that I am not that person who is constantly on my smartphone and tablet watching graphs go up and down. It can be an intimidating thing. What would you recommend? Yes, um, that's where you would need the expertise of a fund manager. Um, so there are products in the market called mutual funds, whereby you can invest in these investment vehicles. You do not have to figure out when it's appropriate to buy and sell. Um, the manager will do that for you. They will also construct the portfolio in such a way as to maximize risk, sorry, maximize return while minimizing risk. And, and those are the type of investment vehicles that you can put money into. It works similar to a bank account in terms of you can fund the account on a monthly basis. Um, there is a management fee, but most returns that you would see on a mutual fund account are net of fees and it does have liquidity in meaning that if you submit a redemption form um, for instance you want to take money out if you submit that on a thursday of a week the following tuesday you will have your money out life happens yes you want to never take money out until you have reached your goal in, in, in the mutual fund but sometimes um, you need to to, to satisfy your liquidity need. For instance, a number of investors who had mutual funds, they were able to survive during the pandemic through their investments. They were able to redeem some of that money to help them um, through those difficult times. And another thing to remember, those of us who are fortunate to remain employed throughout the, the 
pandemic, your savings would have gone up because there was nothing to do. There was nowhere to go. So I know we do say, well, I can't save, but there are instances where, depending on the circumstance, your savings went up. So it, it can be done. It just takes a little commitment. That's my advantage. Well, I want to actually bring the attention back to what invariably happened, especially during the lockdowns. It's only really this year that we have been able to, quote unquote, open up because we have two entrepreneurs here who are very uh, entertainment dependent um, for making their money, while not all of it, a, a significant amount of it. So let's start with Faith. How were investments able to help you ride out the COVID impact when crop over wasn't on the cards, touring wasn't on the cards, traveling wasn't on the cards, there was there was no card. <laughs> uh, nothing at all. Um, I would say that it was definitely my life saver. Um, and that's how I actually got into investing because as you rightfully said, the bulk of my income came from entertainment, whether it be crop over, um holding events whatever the case may be and you know that was nothing so I was put in a position where I had no choice but to look for something else to do and for me uh looking for a nine to five was not it for me because I know that would take away from the passion um, of being an artist because that's what I want to do so I looked into investing and that's how I got into trading forex and looking into crypto and stuff like that and it's because of, you know, having that, that education to finding out what investments are. And I did have a slight background at university, but I kind of just put that one side when I decided I wanted to be an artist. Um, but tapping back into that, um, was I was able then to still put out music during COVID, put out videos, and obviously sustain a life, you know, food, gas, um, that type of stuff. So it was definitely a, a, a switch for me mentally, understanding that diversity is important um, and investing is important. So it was literally a saving grace for me. <laughs> and what about you, Hachi? Because apart from entertainment, you also had a transport business, but a lot of us weren't going anywhere either. So <laughs> how, did, how did that work for you? Okay, so I think mine was on the other end of, of Fifth's situation where I wasn't entirely dependent on entertainment. Um, I had a day job at nine to five. And again, she spoke about that, that diversification. Um, that was also good for me where I kind of was always taught from young, uh, save somebody for a, a rainy day. So while I was actually focus on the entertainment business and the entertainment sector as much. What, what funds I gained from that, I used to start my transportation business a bit before the pandemic. Um, I also used the pandemic's time to educate myself um, on stock markets, um, platforms, to the, um, online where we was able to put some some ink come there for a bit and that then I also got help my situation for a few months um so, so again I was actually able to set up my set up in a way before the hard times that the entertainment would not necessarily be the, the set for the that I was most actually the, the dependent on. So you did not waste a good crisis. Good for you. Uh, <laughs> no, I did not. Um, I actually spent that time online um, a lot. Facebook, the, the YouTube, and a bit. Um, as the investment guys here said, there's a bunch of information out there that you guys can definitely read. And, use to your um, advantage and strengths. So let me ask, especially our, our experts in finance, I mean, when's a good time to start? I mean, some people get their first job at 16, 
part-time job that might be working at a supermarket or what have you. They may not necessarily be thinking, oh, I should put away some for mutual fund. Um, but that most of us will probably get our first employable nine to fives by about age 23, 24. When do we start realistically thinking about how do I put away for um, the future and where do I divest this money? Well, realistically, you can start once you start earning an income. Um, age is not um, a prerequisite or anything like that. I remember the first time I saved and invested money, I was 10 years old. I used to wash my parents' car and I managed to save that $5 I used to charge them for a year or two. And I remember the amount, I had $400 and I opened a savings account with, with that money. So, and another story to share, which is relevant um, in this context with these two entrepreneurs, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, famous actor and bodybuilder. Um, when he was doing bodybuilding, and this is not in the 2000s or the 90s or the 80s, he was doing it in the late 60s, early 70s. And any prize money he won, he set money aside. And in that time, I, don't, I can't imagine that bodybuilding uh, prize money was significant <laughs> at that time. But he saved, he said he saved um, every, every amount, every time he won prize money. And he said he invested in an income producing property. He invested in apartments and he had, he held, had that for a while and sold it off in the future. So what he was saying, he was a millionaire before he even got into acting. Um, so it, it is something to consider. And it also shows once you have a commitment, you do your due diligence on, on an investment. Like I said, for most of us that don't have the time um, to educate ourselves on investing itself, there are um, advisors out there and there are investment vehicles that can take that kind of um, expertise out of your hands and, and you can save for a, a particular goal that you have in mind. And I, 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 I would kind of, if I could jump on the thread um, as well too, in terms of um, the best time to invest and the best time to save. And I agree, the earlier, the better. And it even, and, and, and Nick's story is very, um, is commendable because um, many times we often learn about investing only in, a, in adulthood and, you know, and late too. So we are, and we often say, if I had known this 15 years earlier, the yeah. damage I could have done, the yeah. wealth that I could have amassed. So I think it is something that we need to um, instill in, in our families and our children. I think that there should be a mutual fund account um, almost in every home. Um, the same way you open a bank account from early, you should open a mutual fund account because you're buying it a diversified fund. You're not concentrating your investment. And when you look at it, um, pound for pound is a relatively uh, moderately uh, risk profile type of investment. So effectively, it is a good way to multiply your wealth and to grow your wealth without necessarily taking on significant risk and having to do um, you know, onerous research, et cetera. You place that in the hands of a, of a wealth manager and yeah. let them go to work and build in wealth. And the other thing is that we need to shift the culture. So we have a, a, a culture of chronic savers, you know, and back in the day when Nick was 10, when I was um, five, et cetera, interest rates, the environment for investing and saving would have been a lot different. You could have possibly put it in the bank and still earn a reasonable rate of interest. So in your mind, um, if you are getting a rate of interest for almost taking on no risk, then for you, that is fine. You have a case now where the banks are giving you effectively zero in terms of yield and interest rate. So it means you now have to really 
go about looking to actually invest if you are looking for a return, especially a return that outpaces inflation over time and gives you some real growth on your wealth. So ideally, it means that even though it is good to save and saving has a purpose because is liquidity management, is management of day-to-day -day expenses, ultimately, um, obviously, you know, growing at a rate of zero um, is very limited growth. So you need to look for opportunities that can actually grow your wealth in a meaningful, real, tangible way. Well, I'd like to bring Shane back in onto this conversation. Um, recently, it was reported that Barbadians have billions sitting down in savings accounts, not millions, billions. <laughs> like, sounds like a lot. Um, and again, you tend to look for those opportunities and read those markets. Um, how would you advise or, or, or what opportunities are there for divesting some of this money from just sitting there with basically 0% um, interest and, and, and it's just sitting? How can we be helping ourselves make more money off of the money that we do have? Yeah. I think the, the conversation so far has looked at mutual funds a lot and, and various investment instruments. And I, I am particularly a fan of mutual funds as well, because I think for the average investor, um, as you rightly said, you don't have either in some cases the expertise or the time to be sitting down trying to understand what are the right companies to invest in, what are the right um, countries I should be targeting. And so I think mutual funds are actually an excellent opportunity to get into to investing. Uh, but of course, there are other instruments you can use. There's real estate. Uh, not everyone might have the, the funds to be able to pick up money and invest in real estate. But if you think you can earn, for example, a 6% rate of return on a piece of real estate and you can borrow from the bank at 4%, um, then you can, you can actually earn more than you would, have, would have to borrow to get the investment. And so you might have the, you might have the cash in the bank, but... The reality is a lot of that cash might be concentrated into, a lot of those deposits are concentrated maybe into large depositors or large companies that might have those deposits, whereas the average person on average may not have a large amount. So I think you can, you can take the cash and do that, but there might also be some scope for people if they want to go bigger to look into uh, getting financing to be able to make the investments that can earn them uh, even more, more money. I mean, essentially that's what corporations do, right? They borrow. Yeah. And then they, they invest and they make a return on it. So you kind of have to see yourself as a mini corporation and kind to of some, to some it. extent. To some <laughs> extent. Of course, corporations, not to get technical, but have limited liability. So you can only recover from them what what uh they own. Um, right. a person might be a slightly different situation, but you'd have to understand the risk you're willing to take and, and then go about it from that perspective. Okay, I want to start to address some of the questions that we actually have in um, our panel box. And this question comes in from someone who asks, can Barbadians invest in overseas stocks? Do I need to go through a broker? What's the process for being able to do so simply? Who wants to take that one? Well, yeah, yes. Um... Normally, you would have to, to go through, there are two things, you would have to go through a broker and you also may need central bank approval to do that. So, um, for instance, um, a brokerage house is Interactive Brokers or E-Trade. Um, Sajikor actually has the Interactive Brokers on its platform here. So, you can set up an account with Sajikor. And, and you will be um, processed onto the interactive broker platform and you can um, buy and sell shares on, on the North American markets. Um, I can add to this sure. one a little bit. Um, yes, uh, as Nicholas said, it's a proactive broker as was one I actually found through the my research in lockdown, I um, I was actually able to find it um, online. It actually allows for international clients. Um, there's also a bunch of information on it online as well. My only problem I found was trying to do transfers of funds on 
concerts that are the actual platform. Mm. I think if you, you have a broker <clears throat> who, who, who is actually able to manage that for you, yeah, and it makes the things a lot actually easier. You would just actually need the approvals from Central Bank to transfer your, your funds onto the platform. And once you have your funds on the platform, it basically allows you to purchase the stock that you want. It allows you to actually do the monetary markets. And the platform is actually one that has a tutorial site as well. So it helps you to basically see what you're doing before you actually made the purchase. But what I would say is um, a, very, a very important part is do not invest more than you're actually willing to kind of lose or uh, uh, actually <laughs> maybe sort of did you burn up in the wrong places? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, because I mean, at the end of the day, investment, yes, is risk based, Definitely. but uh, fortune favors the brave, and you're making uh, an informed decision. It's not like let it all ride on Black 23. So, <laughs> um, you're making an informed decision with, with the information that you've got available to you. So someone here is asking, what are some of your go-to resources for keeping up to speed about investing? What resources would you recommend for a beginner or intermediate investors? Sure. Um, in terms of keeping up to speed, I mean, there are websites like Bloomberg, um, Market Watch. Um, there are a host of, and, and Hachi would have indicated, you know, YouTube is, is usually a very um, useful tool. Um, there's Investopedia. Um, so there are a host of online um, resources that you could tap into. And there's nothing better than face-to-face than -face discussion. And us at Saji Corey, me, we've been in this space um, for quite some time. In fact, uh, for over 20 years, we've been managing money in this space. So there's nothing um, better than sometimes sitting down and having that conversation. And we are very open door in terms of our approach and we would encourage persons to come in, chat with us and, you know, let us be able to, you know, assist you, um, guide you and um, help you with the, the money management decisions. I think that might have helped the next person here who asks, how do you go about investing for competing goals? For example, retirement versus home ownership versus travel, basic living. Um, it sounds like what most of us think about, like how am I supposed to take this $1 and split it up into all of these different things and still feel like I'm living life? Yes, and I, I, I can take that as well. Yes. So in terms of um, working towards uh, various goals, it is a matter of kind of setting out almost individual investment policies for those respective goals. So for instance, and the, and the thing is about it, you can have varying risk tolerances as well um, that would be goal specific. For instance, if you're re, um, saving towards retirement, that is fairly a long-term horizon. It means you can be a lot more aggressive most of the time. Um, within a moderate level of risk, you still want to have adequate diversification going on within the portfolio, but versus let's say home ownership, or buying that first piece of land. You may want to accumulate wealth in that regard over, uh, uh, let's say a five year or, or, or medium term horizon. It means that the shorter the horizon, generally you want to be a, a tad bit more conservative with how you allocate or the level of investment that you, you, you place those funds in to deliver the, the, the capital or the, the liquidity that you're seeking to utilize within that time frame. So the longer, generally, you can go more aggressive, the shorter, the tenor, you might want to be uh, pair back on the risk and be a little bit more, um, you know, conservative. Okay, um, that might have skated into what this other question um, asked, can I use an investment for a rainy day fund? Certainly. That is the premise of investing. Okay. Investing is effectively you're deferring instant gratification with the expectation that you earn a return. So you are putting away those funds 
And depending on the instrument, now we talk about the various assets and the various asset classes. And I know we spoke heavily, Nick and myself, on mutual funds and securities versus, and, and I know Shane would have touched on real estate, et cetera. That brings in a very good point, which is liquidity. Now, if you are invested in mutual funds, these tend to be investments, as Nick alluded to, you could easily come in and you can bring in a redemption form by the Thursday of a particular week. And by the next week, the Tuesday or so forth, because the funds are valued every Friday. And those requests are processed at the forward nav. So by the next week, you could let your appeal and you can make and you can go about effectively, um, you know, um, dealing with the rainy day scenario that may have come up. Now, if you had it invested in real estate per se, if you place all your eggs in real estate, again, it means that, you know, you often hear about the term asset rich cash poor. It may make it very difficult for you to convert that investment to liquidity. Hence the reason why you have to look at asset allocation. What portion of your portfolio you want in liquid securities versus what portion of your portfolio you don't mind locking up in a, a liquid or a long-term manner. And that those are important decisions all within the realm of um, achieving optimal diversification, which is you simply want the total risk or your portfolio to be less than the absolute risk, the sum of the absolute risk of the individual investments while maintaining um, the expected level or the desired level of return. So you call that improving your risk to reward ratio. And that's what you really want to develop over time. And just, well, with just that being add, said, is cash still king? Yeah, I was just going to add to what Mike was saying and regarding cash. And for the same rainy day scenario, um, sometimes it is suggested that it's good to have at least three months salary in, in your savings account. Some will even say th three to six months, but six months is very difficult. Um, but definitely three months is a, is a good baseline to have um, in savings alone at, at a bank account. And then the rest, as, as Mike said, can be invested in your mutual funds and so on. So I don't think it would be um, wise of us to end the session today without delving into cryptocurrency, which I probably appreciate is still unfurling and it's still developing. But what should we know at this stage about crypto, its risks, um, it being a viable form of investment for the future? Is it really the future? of investment? I think we can start. Um, I do see it as a viable form of investing. We know that money, the form of money is changing. We see the evolution over the years. Um, and a lot of people are accepting it. And it's, it has a lot of backing as well. So people are using it and tying um, different things to it that gives it more viability and acceptance worldwide. Um, we saw that the Staple Center, they, they renamed it to uh, crypto. Um, so to be, to ignore it, I think would not be <laughs> the best form of action. Um, it is scary for a lot of people because it is new, but that's just it, it's new. And I think education is where it starts. Um, and it's not too late to be educated on it. You don't have to just jump in and say, okay, I want to buy Bitcoin, for instance, because that is the most popular coin. But there's so many other coins out there that you can educate yourself on and invest in some that are not even a cent as yet. And, you know, when that value increases, you have a much greater opportunity of return on your dollar. So for me, it's basically just educating yourself on, you know, what is crypto and how you could tap into it, the ways that you could tap into it, the sites that you could use um, to tap into it, um, and just, you know, wait for the evolution to, to continue because it's already started, in my opinion. And um, finally, just for this question and answer segment, because um, 
much has been said about, you know, with central bank approval, which, you know, makes sense and, and we're pretty sure we know why, but do you foresee a time when there will just be um, greater access to be able to move laterally without as many permissions as perhaps we would have had to have sought in the past? I think, well, perhaps I can add a bit there. Um, <laughs> Please I do, don't, Shane. <laughs> <forward to> this. <laughs> I mean, I think at some point, I think certainly the central bank seems to have gone to start that process already. I think at some point, I think it was last year, year before, they started to allow uh, Barbados to be able to hold US dollar accounts, I think up to a certain level. Um, I don't think that is something that is going to happen just um, just like that, like turn on a switch and you go from having to make, have approvals to not at all. But there is certainly value in countries having what they call open capital accounts or a situation where you can move money around. I think that's something that's going to happen though when the country is in a position to handle it. Because as you can imagine, um, if you just did that tomorrow, people might decide, oh, I want to shift a lot of my money overseas. Uh, but then there are implications for the level of reserves. And then it also means that the central bank then, uh, then has to take a perspective of, okay, what are the level of interest rates that we need to have in Barbados to restrict money from flowing out of the country? So until you have a situation where the economy is in a place where interest rates can maybe rise to a level that are a bit higher to match what is outside, and also where the reserves and the inflows coming in from tourism, et cetera, are sufficient to keep those reserves at a comfortable level, and I think it's going to be a more gradual approach to that rather than uh, just, a, a, you know, flicking a switch and you can take money out easily or more easily, I should say. So in your estimation, what type of investments would help to build um, wealth in the country so we can retain as much money as possible for our needs and our resources? Yeah. Do you mean for the, for the average individual? Yeah, for the average individual, what, what should they be investing in that would um, overall build build the overall wealth where they are? Well, I think I think the good thing about the mutual funds is that they have exposure to Barbados, but they also have exposure outside. So you can actually take your Barbados dollars and you can invest in the mutual funds. And you still get the exposure to international markets, right? Um, I'm also a fan of, of real assets, right? So whether it be real estate or DJ Hachi mentioned as well that he has a transportation business. Um, these are all investments as well, because as we said already, an investment is just an initial outlay. You delayed self-gratification to make a return on something. And sometimes, uh, so, some, so I'm putting it in the bank um, at the current interest rates, unfortunately won't earn you a great deal compared to the inflation rate, but you might be able to find something else out there that allows you to do that. So, I, I think there are a number of opportunities, um, having a, a small business, a hairdresser, all of these are investments, but we don't think about them sometimes in that way. Yeah. And to Nicholas's point about being intentional about your investing, um, somebody is asking, apart from real estate, would it be wise to borrow with the intention of investing? Yes. Um... As Shane mentioned, if you if you can borrow and then invest at a higher rate, it is um, something worth considering. But the risk to bor to bar to borrowing to invest is that there's something called gearing. So you can potentially borrow and, and earn um, a high return, but if the investment doesn't work out you still have to pay back on the loan, okay? So it, it, there, there is a risk involved there, but um, it, it can offer a greater return, but you really have to do your, your, your due diligence on, on, on an idea like that. And just to mention some of the risks involved in crypto, we saw, we spoke of the, the good side of crypto. It's important to mention Crypto is, is very volatile, so it's, it's not appropriate for all ages. So someone close to retirement who has accumulated um, wealth, they probably, it's not suitable for them to take on that type of investment 
because it potentially could lose a big chunk of what it accumulated. Um, it, it's great to look at it from a long-term perspective. Um, just to give you an idea, I think Bitcoin reached about 60,000 last year at some point. It's, it's now down to 30,000. So that's just to give an idea of the volatility involved in investing in crypto. Mm -hmm. It was meant to be um, digital gold because um, gold is, a, is an asset class that tends to be stable over time and it's a good inflation hedge. Um, but crypto during the, the pandemic, it, it went down significantly, but it bounced back up as well. So, so those are just some of the, the risks involved in that, that it should be. And you mentioned something very interesting there because you spoke about the individual who might be at the stage of retirement and maybe they would have uh, garnered a certain amount of wealth, but not every investment is wise for every stage in life. And whereas it's probably never too early to invest, could it be a little too late to invest in certain things based on life expectancy? Definitely um, certain things, um, but even if you're late, no time better than, than now. Okay, it's better to, to start at some point. Um, but yes, there are certain investments that are not suitable for everyone. That is why, as Mike said, have a conversation um, before you pull the trigger on any investments, so to speak, or educate yourself as much as possible. Um, don't data mine in terms of you're looking for all the good things about what you heard. Also, try to research what are the downsides of, of, of this potential investment that I um, wanted to make. And I would, I would, I would also kind of add to the, the discussion at this stage too, in terms of um, when you're planning for retirement. Now, the other part of retirement is this, right? Life expectancy has increased. So there is the risk, the, you call it longevity risk, where you can effectively outlive your assets. And you're finding more and more that persons, especially in the low interest rate environment, you are no longer um, seeing the level of income producing assets or the assets are not producing income at the levels to sustain sometimes the required spend. So it means that over the course of time, especially when you're dealing with inflation rising you still need as a retiree to really look at your total portfolio it comes down again to the allocation question and the diversification question because if you have a concentrated portfolio already in let's say fixed income and conservative investments this may be the time even though you're near retirement or in retirement to add a component of equities which has the potential now to earn some capital appreciation that can then lift the yield or lift the, 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 um, the, the, the overall income producing nature of your portfolio. And whether that equity be true, um, high dividend paying stocks, um, et cetera, those things can also add some diversification. At the same time, um, they can enhance your return and is important because especially nowadays, a lot of persons are opting to kind of leave the workforce early. So you got a scenario where you could actually live longer in retirement than the time frame that you actually work. So your assets now need to produce and sustain you for an extended period of time. So all of those are considerations that we try to work through with you on an individual basis in terms of coming up with the optimal portfolio to serve you in, in things like retirement. And I'm not sure that there's going to be enough time to talk about this because I still feel like it's one of those uh, very developing issues. But the question being asked is how do you see the metaverse and NFTs having an impact on the local financial landscape? Digital, digital. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Come on, in, in, term, in terms of seeing it on like how it's affecting the financial landscape, I'm honestly not too sure. But what I will say is that we can't ignore it. Like there is a wealth of 
wealth <laughs> um, to be earned in in these NFT spaces um, using crypto. Crypt, NFTs uses crypto to execute the different entities and stuff like that. So you would see stuff like Ethereum linked to NFTs and more cryptocurrencies are going mm -hmm. in that space as well. Um, we actually have a Barbadian here in Barbados artist, Barbadian artist who just launched a music video from NFT earnings. Um, and he's been pushing that really hard. So there's, especially in music, there is opportunity to earn significantly with NFTs, um, whether that be digitizing photographs, digitizing your music, um, digitizing like land, stores like there's a wealth of opportunity and again because it's new sometimes it could be frightening sometimes it could be oh i ain't too sure about this um but we just have to again educate ourselves and ride with the evolution so that we stay in a place where we can capitalize on the opportunity um when we see fit individually that like everybody's not going to be able to capitalize on it at the same time based on your knowledge of it but I'll definitely say don't be left behind when it comes to that education. Right, so where there may not be a huge long track record at the moment, um, you can track the record as it goes. Yes, <laughs> most definitely. That makes good sense. And I want to give everyone the opportunity to have their uh, final say on investments. I know one thing for sure, come with your questions when sitting <laughs> down with your advisor and don't be shy about asking the questions that you wanna ask. We're gonna start in Washington with Shane uh, in terms of just investments on the whole and putting ourselves in that mind space of being the investor and not just sitting back on the sidelines. Yeah, no, I think I think we should see investments as another part of our allocating our funds to what we, um, you know, the cash that we get every month in terms of income. Um, the reality is that most of us put the money in the bank or most of us, the money goes to the bank directly. And I think at some point we have to think about, well, what is the foregone, not just about the fact that it's going to maintain its value or you might get a 0.1% interest on it. But what is the foregone revenue or return that you could have gotten if you put it into something else? And I think those that is the sort of mindset that you have to think about when you're thinking about investing. What could I earn on this? And essentially, what am I giving up in the future by, by just leaving it either in the bank account or by spending it on consumption that I may not need? Um, so it's just a bit of a, a, mindset, a mindset shift. But... Certainly, there, there are opportunities out there, whether it be in mutual funds or other assets, that you can find somewhere to make a return over time. Fantastic. Hachi. Yes, ma'am. Um, just a few things. I want to say to everybody here, um, pay attention, um, plan and actually really set um, a plan for the future for your investment forever. If you have to set um, a budget of monthly, Make sure that you know exactly where you are at, 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 at most points. But what I also say is it's not really about how much you earn, but it's how you, you actually spend your funds and where you actually spend your funds. That's the most important thing. Um, what I also say is don't invest more than you're actually willing to, to lose. That's a very uh, important point. Uh, and then that takes you into making sure that where, where you actually spend makes sense. So don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Um, you, you, I'm pretty sure everybody knows that that's, that that's um, a major key. And the earlier you start to invest, the better. So if you've been thinking about it, trust me, go ahead and talk to your financial advisors. There are people who sit and watch the markets all day, every day. That's their job. Sit, have chats with them. Join group chats. Join Facebook rooms. Join clubhouse. Have the chats with the, the persons who would know exactly where to see trends. We we have we we all actually spend time on social media with cell phones and laptops. There are a bunch of apps out there where 
you can find uh, C Trends, Yahoo Finance, MSNBC, all of these. Watch the trends, see how the things are happening, educate yourselves on finance, educate yourselves on investments so that things make more sense to you. Um, don't necessarily be like me, who's who might have been one of the ones in 1980 who thought the internet <laughs> might not have, have made sense. Educate yourselves on the NFTs, <laughs> cryptocurrency, um, and investments. And again, it's all about who you 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 you're actually around to educate you. So if you go again, we do those group chats. If you go actually be on WhatsApp, yes, talk to your financial advisors, talk to your friends who might like, know a little more about finance than you. And there's a bunch of information online. Sit on YouTube, watch the videos, sit on, on online and read it with some articles and get as much as you you you, you actually can. And we have set of experts here who are definitely happy to help anybody. So for sure. Nicholas, one such expert. <laughs> yes, yes. No, I would just say um investing does not have to be scary. Um, it is not exclusive to those who already have wealth, those who are rich. Um, it's about making a scheduled commitment to, to add into a portfolio. Um, a number of people made the mistake of making an initial outlay and they don't add to that portfolio. For instance, in our mutual funds, the initial minimum is $500 and a number of people they're always capable of, of investing that first 500, but as soon as you advise, you know, you should at least at a minimum add $100 a month over, over time, they can't find that $100. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why I say stay committed to your investment plan. What is your investment goal? Um, don't just think of a goal that is unattainable. Um, as she mentioned, speak to those with knowledge. Um, I would stay away from a friend of mine told me statement. Um, really try to educate and, uh, and seek those um, who have professional experience in, in, in the field. And trust me, if, if everyone who's on the call today, just give yourself a year of investing. Commit yourself to one year. Mm -hmm. See what your balance is at the end of that year, and and then at that point in time, you can say to yourself, "Okay, that's not for me." But I'm I'm confident that it will show you the benefits of investing. Excellent, Faith. Yes, please. My crypto. Um, I concur with what everyone said for sure. Um, and what I would add, I find that a lot of people have that. I want money, I want money, no mindset. And that's not investing. Investing is definitely a long-term game and you have to have the right mindset going into it um, to see it through. So have a why attached to your investing as well, whether it be goals as you know we said here today, but have a why so you are committed to that process, committed to that investment, whether it be a year or what's not, but you know, commit to that process and, and don't feel like you need to get this big return on your money now because there will be dips, there will be highs, there will be lows. Um, but ultimately, once again, once you're educated, once you are around the right circles, you have your portfolio managers, asset managers, um, and you're educated on the right types of investments to make, then you could write out those, those lows, you could write out those ways. Um, and just create that generational wealth, that future for yourself through the investments, because as we've been seeing here, you know, saving on the bank, that's not going to create that wealth for you. It might get you through the rainy day when you need it, but what happens after the rainy day? What happens to your children? What happens to the generations after that? So really mindset, having that education, and writing it through um, would definitely be my closing remarks for today. Thank you so much. And Michael. Yes, thank you. Um, my closing remarks, I would say that 
there's no one approach that fits all. And I think that that is important to understand as varying, as, as various investors. Um, investing is all about accumulating assets, um, having a diverse stream of income to meet your liabilities and expenses across the different stages of life. And I think it is very critical that we also look at other financial products to augment and mitigate against contingencies. For instance, um, if you are a conservative investor who would have saved your money um, from working over many years, you would have made some conservative investments and you felt very comfortable at retirement, um, but you failed to put aside you know, those risk mitigating measures like you know, adequate medical insurance and so forth, and then you know, you're presented with an ailment that can erode your wealth significantly. So I see those things as some good hedges against um, erosion of wealth, especially for persons as they age and so forth. Now, many of us, I think we share the same sentiment, right? The attributes of having a plan follow through, being um, intentional, being consistent. Life will change, you will have to make adjustments. Make those adjustments, but remain steadfast. The other thing is that over the course of time, you have to look at effectively, um, you know, starting early, I would say, because when you start early, you get to benefit on the investment side from compound interest. And back to those risk mitigation measures, the earlier you put those in place as well, you're usually in a better health, a better place that you can afford them, they're cheaper. And, and, and over the course of time, you even become what people would term to be uninsurable. So if, you're, if your health deteriorates, et cetera. So it's important to, within an overall total financial wellness plan. And, 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 and as I said, you know, we, you look at physical fitness, some people like to do yoga, some people like to dance, some people will use the gym, some people will go on the road and run. Um, you know, my, 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 my coach when I would keep you running, he prefers um, more hit at, um, exercise. But the point that I'm making is that there's no one approach that fits you, and therefore you need to sit down. And where necessary, I mean, back to the points that, you know, Nick Hashi would have made in terms of educating yourself, nothing is wrong with that. Um, you know, we are professionals here that are ready to embrace any questions, answer any questions, lend any perspectives, um, whether it be on local markets, international markets, um, our, our portfolio management process, et cetera, feel free to engage us. Um, it's an open door policy. I mean, if you want myself, I can give you it. No, that's how open door it is, right? 231-9807. Feel free to call me. It just answered calls, the question, actually. <laughs> I get calls on the weekend if necessary. At the end of the day, this is not just a job. This is a career that we have chosen, and this is our life. So at the end of the day, we are here to help you and assist you. I want to thank you all so very much. We had a fantastic panel today, varied, but all excited about the opportunities of investment. And they just want other people to get involved and see their money a little bit differently as well. So I want to thank from Washington, Shane Lowe, thank you so much. Faith Callender, Danilo Hutchinson, Nicholas Neckles, and of course, we also had Michael. I have a nickname for him, but I won't say it now. <laughs> we'll, we'll go right ahead. That's right. <laughs> million Dollar Mike. Million Dollar Mike. That's, that's what I call him. Absolutely. And I want to thank Sajikor so much for continuing this educational program mm -hmm. that you can log into, ask your questions. Um, absolutely call Sajikor and get in touch with a wealth or fund manager and see where you're at. You're probably not even in as bad a position as you think. Trust me, I learned that from experience. So you just need to make some adjustments and see your money a little bit differently and work towards some intentional goals. And Sajikor will be with you for Let's Talk, Building Your Financial Foundation. I want to thank the entire team making this possible. And of course, our panelists and you, the participants for keeping us engaged on our toes and excited about our money. Thank you so much. 
Yes, for those who, who would have been interested, um, the cell number again is 231-9807. And because I did say it earlier in the show, I'm going to let you know now that all the participants who have logged in today, you have given your information and in return, you're going to receive a budgetary planner. So how about that? So that gets you started. Sagicor is going to give you your own budgetary planner so you can get started. And then you contact a wealth manager, a fund manager, any consultant you feel you, you're going to need at Sagicor and get started on your money management goals and investing. Perfect.